Queens. And all I did was fill prescriptions. I was 12. I was smart enough to fill a prescription. It said 12 capsules of uh, penicillin, 500 milligrams. He showed me. You look on the P, penicillin. You look to make sure the capsule matches that. And you put it in, the, in, a, in a, a vial. So I was filling prescriptions while old Doc ate the lunch that his wife sent. And in comes a man from the city department of whatever. And he looks over the counter and he says to me, hi, young man. Uh, hi, what are you doing? He's, oh, I see you're just filling prescriptions. I didn't know anything. I said, mm-hmm. I was a kid. I was glad to have a job. I was making 50 cents an hour. It helped me get through high school and buy the few things I needed for myself. I didn't have a big allowance. I had no allowance. I had to work for it. So next thing you know, he goes over to Doc and almost gave him a heart attack because he told him he was closing him down because he let a kid fill prescriptions. Now, you may say, okay, that, that makes sense. No kid should be able to fill prescriptions. Well, in those days, a 12-year-old kid like me probably was as smart as the pharmacist coming out of schools today. I didn't have to compound the prescription, although I learned how to do that from Doc as well when I was 11. You see, you put a little of the sulfur powder in. It says uh, two milligrams or whatever. And then you put a certain amount of that in here and that, and you grind it. He gave me a mortar and pestle. I was actually making prescriptions. He taught me everything. And I didn't have to go to pharmacies. <laughs> cool. What I'm saying is I saw what government could do. I saw it when I was a social worker in New York. 1965, I worked on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I was ministering to the to the welfare recipients. It's a very expensive neighborhood now, as is every other neighborhood in Manhattan. Beautiful apartments on Riverside Drive overlooking the Hudson River. Liberal Central now. I love those apartments. I couldn't afford to live in them. Most of them were welfare recipients with garbage cans in the hall, rats in the street. And I, uh, I started to come of age as a thinker because I was a welfare worker. I saw how they were abusing the system. I wrote a little play about it called The Investigator, which is probably going to be part of a book I put out in the near future of early writings. But so I've been around, I've looked at things with my own eyes, and I've tried to draw my own conclusions, which I think are correct. And as far as I am concerned, Obama is the worst thing that ever happened to America in the entire history of the nation. A foreign army could not have done the damage to the military that he has done. He has so destroyed the military, he could hardly do its job. He has put radical feminists in the highest positions for which they're not qualified in the military. He has lowered the standards. He has destroyed systems. So on a military level, we're weak. On an economic level, this is all hoc hocus pocus. You think this economy has recovered? It's all printed money. It's built upon a house of sand. It's paper. He, he built the economy back up by printing paper. Trillions and trillions of dollars of, substantially de of substantial debt was created in order to create the sense that we have come back out of the recession. The healthcare system, you may say that's the greatest thing America, pardon me, has ever done. Well, just like the Iran deal, which he said he doesn't want to confront now, he wants someone else to confront it. Do you have any idea what this, this socialized medicine is going to do to this country once it clicks in? How are we going to pay for the millions of illegal aliens and their health care? Tell me how. Who's going to pay for it? Where is the money going to come from? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? No, it's not a great success. Again, he kicked it down the road. So another administration would have to pay for it and say, holy God, we can't afford this. And then make them look bad when they take away health care from 30 million illegal aliens or God knows how many others. Do you understand that? Climate change. If it's so absolutely proven that man is destroying the earth, then why won't these 97% of so-called scientists ever hold an open debate with climate skeptics? Why do they refuse to debate the same way Hillary Clinton refuses to debate? Because a one-party Marxist government never debates. When have you last seen Jerry Brown debate anything? When have you last seen any Democrat ever debate anything? Tell me. Tell me why the Democrats refuse to debate even amongst themselves. Because that's how Marxism operates. That's how socialism operates. That's how dictatorships operate. No debate. Do it my way or the highway. So if you want to live in North Korea, you're on the road to North Korea by voting for a Democrat. And the only hope we have on the Republican side, now there are other good men, don't get me wrong. There's some really brilliant good men. E any one of them would be a better president than Obama is. All the way down to Huckabee, who I happen to respect greatly. But I don't think they're electable. I don't think they have a chance to be elected. I know Trump has a great chance not only to be elected, but to save America. 
And that's because I started out poor and worked every day of my life since I'm a child to have everything I have right now. No one gave me anything. And I know what it is to work hard and to achieve success. It requires enormous effort and the unwillingness to quit. I could have quit many, many times along the way. I'm not going to sit here and, co and complain to you or cry to you. Some days I get up, I don't even want to do radio. I can't do it. It's too hard for me. And guess what? I go ahead and I do the show because it's an important thing to do, and I come alive doing the show, like today. I'm energized because Donald Trump was on. It's, it's put a shot in the arm for me. It made me feel good. It made me feel hopeful. It made me feel as though I'm helping heal the nation, that we have a shot however long distance it might be, given the Electoral College, given the fact that the evil, corrupt Clinton machine owns the Electoral College in advance, given the fact that she won't debate anybody, given all these facts, at least we have a glimmer of a hope with Donald Trump. I don't feel the same thing about Cruz. I don't feel the same thing about any of the others. I think they're nothing but tin horn politicians. And that's it. It's one man's opinion. That's how I feel. That's what I say. And if you get on with Savage, you'll reach more people than you have met in your entire life. And I'll be right back to take your calls. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. In the next hour, we're going to talk about Donald Trump's appearance and also the war on police, primarily by Barack Obama, Al Sharpton, Eric Holder, and Black Lives Matter as their street thugs. Pigs in a blanket, fry me like bacon. The net effect has been to demonize police and diminish the job, driving people out of the business of policing. And ask yourself this question, all you stupid liberals who are celebrating. Who do you think is going to fill the void? The thugs in Black Lives Matter, fry me like bacon, pigs in a blanket. Who do you think is going to apply for these jobs? Gang members. The very thugs who police have kept in check will become the police, which is exactly what Al Sharpton and Barack Obama want. It's chilling when you think about it. Police force losses about double the amount of officers per year than in the past. Police are being driven out of careers by these thugs. The shield has lost its shine. And young men and women who would have gone into this thin blue line are not going in it. So if you want the thugs in Black Lives Matter to be the police, if you want illegal aliens from gangs to become police, you're doing a great job. You are going to see chaos like you've never seen in your life. You're going to see chaos from the white communists and the black radicals who are destroying police across America. That's what I want to talk about. No matter what grand juries have found, no matter what juries have found, no matter what the Justice Department itself has found, they keep up the lying narrative about Ferguson, along with Mr. Climate Change, the man who lies about the glaciers, lies about what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. And this is the result. Total chaos, the breakdown of civil society, the breakdown of science, the breakdown of an America. That's why I'm for Trump. Be here or be not. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It's a great day for me because we had a great interview. Whether you like Trump or don't or trust him or not, that's your business. I'm not here to convince you. I'm mean, like you to believe that he's the right guy and he can defeat Hillary Clinton who won't debate anybody and she comes from a corrupt machine and that America deserves a better shot and that a rich man is probably safer than a poor man. You know, things like that. But on an emotional level, radio is a very interesting business to be in, especially in interesting times like these. 
And when you get a mainstream guest like that, I'm not a guest-driven show for two reasons. One, they tend to throw me off, and I'm a free uh, thinker. See, I'm a free thinker. I don't run off scripts. A, free thinker. Number two, I'm a free associator, which is the hardest thing in the world to do in radio. You say it's rambling. Well, all right, you can call it that if you want. But one day I'll explain to you what free association is. It began with the Bible, and then it runs through Irish literature, which I've described for you in the past. Tristram, you know Tristram, the, the Irish author? I forget who wrote that. What was his name? Great, great piece of work where he writes as his mind keeps rolling, rolling, rolling. So the whole thing about free association is you take the biggest chances in the world and uh, either you will, you know, you, you succeed or you don't succeed. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do. Today I feel good about it. And I don't really want to get into me and personalities and why I feel good and why I don't feel good. It's not your business. What I had for lunch. You know, you're not interested today. I'm going to save that for Friday, the week, uh, th this Friday. Very personal day because most people will be gone. They're taking 15 day weekends now. Nobody was here Monday. The whole week people are gone already. The houses are empty in the, in, the, in the white suburbs. No one works. Does anyone work anymore? I don't understand this. Where do they make a living from? Are they living on, on inheritance, coupons? I don't get it. Who actually goes to work anymore other than me? I ask myself every day. Donald Trump goes to work. He runs his, his, his business. <laughs> you know that the very wealthy people work seven days a week. You don't know that. Everyone I know who's rich works seven days a week. How is it that you can reach someone worth billions of dollars at any time of the day or night on their iPhone if they want to talk to you? They're working. Whereas other people won't answer a phone other than 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. <laughs> Monday to Friday. It's, a, it's a state of mind. So we need someone to work seven days a week for America, which is what hopefully we all do in the media. Not just for ourselves and for our ratings, which are very important, but I don't want to go into that right now. I once had a program director way back in the beginning of radio on KSFO, 1994. And I'm one of those guys that came out of a statistical background and being someone who understood statistics and stuff, I used to read my ratings like people would read horse betting track, you know, prognostications. And he said to me, you know, Michael, he said, ratings in, the, in this business go up and down. Don't take them too seriously. I said, what do you mean? He said, because you, no one could go up, 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 up because then you'd have a 10 or a 15 share and there'd be no one else left. It doesn't work that way. People, you know, tune around, they scan up and down. You know, who has a 10 share anymore during the day? Nobody. We're running on one shares, two shares, two and a half shares of the entire listening audience. And I, I have to, I guess I have to address that. The audience in talk radio has been diminishing over the last few years for many reasons. A changing media landscape, a changing demographic, Two big factors. Look, if you have 75 to 100 choices to tune into during my show, you're going to probably not tune in. And if you do, you're not going to listen as long as you used to. I used to have the longest TSL and talk radio time spent listening. People would listen for an hour, an hour and a half a day to the show. Those numbers have gone down dramatically, time spent listening, because people don't have the time nor the inclination. And then there's another factor, which is the oversaturation of conservative talk radio by people who never belonged in the business, who only read news stories over and over again, and there's no entertainment value, but they're on the radio, they have good slots, good stations, and they suck the, the oxygen out of the rest of us. But you go on, that's all. You get up every day, and you, you're a champion for America's borders, language, and culture. It's been my mantra since 1994, meaning on radio, and it'll be so as long as God wants me to keep talking. Then I will leave radio, and if I'm still living, I'll do something else, which I'm thinking about now. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? And I don't know if I'm going to have a rest of my life, nor if, I, if I'm going to leave radio when. It's not now. It's not for a while. But when it happens, and it will, because no one wants to do this three hours a day for the rest of their life. But then I ask myself, what am I going to do with myself? I'll take care of animals like I do. I say to myself, but there's a pretty empty world out there. And once you've been in this, which is the most exciting business in the entire world. And I consider myself the luckiest man on earth because there were many years that I was struggling to find myself. And through chance and hard work and never giving up and never quitting, I am here. And I've stayed here despite every possible impediment you can imagine. You can't imagine what was thrown at me to stop me from day one. And I'm, 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 I'm telling you all this to thank you. 
Because I got listeners who've listened to me almost from the day I started. Why I'm doing this now, I don't know. I have no idea why.